This meeting is being recorded.
This meeting is being recorded. I think it's a really nice quote because it's emphasizing that we do have the power as youth.
that area or that science. And you're particularly likely to see those rules no longer define a playable game and maybe conceive new rules. And I really like this concept and it kind of drives the importance of thinking beyond health and even maybe putting yourself in areas or situations that you're not used to because you have a different perspective and you might be able to share a very exciting insight. So thinking about expanding your knowledge, looking at different perspectives, what can you do? So the first one that I think is quite important, and we also saw this with a lot of the missing look at things differently than you. And also, I, I agree, and I think the old paradigm, perhaps, in, in our way of educational system is to specialize. But it's important to specialize and be an expert in something, but it's also important to understand the other fields and understand what those other fields can contribute to your work. And also, I, I think it's very important to be responsible for your own upskilling. And we're really in a day and age where that's thankfully possible. And there's an example I'd like to give of a colleague here at Oxford, I won't say her name, but uh, she shared a story that she upskilled herself in quantitative research methods. And then now she's using that and is one of the individuals that's really almost the best in this type of methodology within her day-to-day -day job. And it's not something that she was taught by someone else. It's not something that she was taught within her own educational system. It's something she did herself. And I think it's a really good example if you have access to these kind of massive open online. Twitter and start to be, it's such a great place to start to spread your voice and to speak openly about what you think is important. As mentioned with the Ladopo's example, really join supportive online organizations. You can even join networks like Johan, for example. Um, there's many networks that are global. You can go for local networks, anything that you think is really going to help you build your confidence in your, in your area and also build your communication skills. And just take, take uh, all advantage of all these different online professional development events. So Ellen has a, from Ghana also has a quote for you. She calls for being stayed, stayed digitalization to stay on top of the news media, most recent articles. So then when you do have that opportunity to speak, you, you have some confidence and you have some research behind what you're speaking about. She also encourages you to volunteer your time um, and build skills through that volunteering experience. I myself have a lot of my skills I built were through volunteering experiences. I did in parallel to my education. And if I didn't have those, I wouldn't be able to apply for the jobs I was able to apply for. And her quote is, be proud of your unique experiences and share them confidently. No one knows Africa's story better than you do. And I think it's wonderful that she highlights the unique experiences and the to be confident. 
So one that I'm quite excited about is this concept of fighting for failure. So often we hear the word failure and it makes us uncomfortable, worried. Maybe we think we're gonna cause more problems than good. Mistakes is not really a fun term either, but there are people out there that are, out there that are looking at failure differently. So for example, in Google, they use this process where they call post-mortem a little bit morbid, but I think it's in a fun way. And they, they as a team reflect on learnings from significant setbacks or undesirable events. And they do it in a way that's very open that that issue or that mistake was acceptable, but it's an opportunity for learning. A lot of uh, clinicians in the audience, I'm sure you know the story of Alexander Fleming and how he discovered penicillin. He had left out essentially a petri dish for too long and mold started to form, form and he saw that it was killing the bacteria around it. Very much a mistake. I think anybody that's worked in a lab, I have, if you got caught leaving a petri dish out over the weekend, you probably would feel quite bad about it. But in this reality, it led to a very, very important um, innovation. And finally, there's this other methodology that's gone viral, it's online. It's called the Church of Fail. Um, it's a monthly ritual that happens in Microsoft where employees are actually invited to stand up as if they're speaking at a podium and confess their mistakes. And people are applauding them and encouraging them from expressing something that often we hide. And it's really the questions is, what did you fail at? What did, how did you cope with that failure? And what did you learn from it? So now I'd like to share a story. I think you recognize this photo. It's a potato chip. And it's kind of, I think, the most important innovation. <laughs> And it happened back in the mid 19th century. Chef George Crum, who was working in a lodge in New York, um, was dealing with a very picky customer who was complaining about the thickness of their French fries, their fried potatoes. As a New Yorker would, he went back and he angrily sliced them very, very thin as if to get back at the customer and say, okay, here you go. But his, to his surprise, the customer loved the crispy thin potato slices. And then they became known as the Saratoga chips. And this was the accidental invention of the potato chips, which is now a beloved stack, snack around the world. I think this story is quite nice because it highlights the failure. In this case, it was an emotional failure. This person was getting angry, tried to do some kind of practical joke. But in reality, it led to very unexpected success. And it's a reminder to embrace those opportunities that might arise out of setbacks. Some additional examples that I think are really important, and I try to remind myself of when failure has led to an innovation. We have the light bulb, and Edison famously says, I have not failed, I've just found 10,000 ways that wouldn't work. I think that's a very good attitude about progress and innovation. Additionally, if you guys work in an office, you're probably quite familiar with the post-it notes. And interestingly, this was created by Spencer Silver, who was trying to create a very strong adhesive, and he accidentally created a weak one and essentially saw it as a fail failure and binned it. And then years later, a colleague of his, Arthur Fry, realized the potential of the weak adhesive and used it to create the sticky note. So I like this example because it shows also you might learn from a failure years down the line and that collaboration and working with someone else is a really good way to set innovations as well. And finally, Disney, we're all probably quite familiar with Walt Disney and he faced multiple businesses failing, rejections. My favorite thing learning from him is he went to 300 banks to finance Disneyland before he finally got one to support him. And now it's become an iconic brand. So maybe you have an idea, maybe you're trying to strive to push something forward and you're getting rejected, but that doesn't mean it's a bad idea. It means you're not in the right place. We're not asking the right people. I'm thinking about failure, but I really wanna emphasize 
recognize is that I think there's a discomfort with the term failure and mistake. And I think it's time we need to start speaking up about the importance of allowing space for failure in order to actually innovate. And there's so many examples out there of how failure leads to innovation. So it's just about trying to push that paradigm and progress so that we can try things out. We can experiment. We're allowed to fail. We're allowed to fail and not be <laughs> Oh, I think someone might be off mute. Oh, great. Perfect. Thank you. Oh, I guess I'm on mute. Sorry. <laughs> okay. Um, I'm not sure when it went on mute, but, but I'll start over. So then the last area I want to focus on is about creating a vision. So this picture is quite nice because if your vision is to climb that mountain, you have to deal with the now, you have to deal with the next, the later, and then finally to the summit. And it's really important to think about what is your vision? Maybe you just want to get to the next. And that's quite all right, but you're only gonna get there if you set the vision. Maybe you wanna get all the way to the summit. You have to set a vision of the path you're gonna to take to get there. There are many different paths across this mountain, but you really need to set exactly where you're gonna go and how you're gonna get there. And in terms of creating your individual vision for your professional development, I think often we get asked, what is your five-year plan? What is your 10-year plan? And it definitely makes me uncomfortable. For me, I like to look at opportunities and make a decision there. But it is good to have some kind of direction of where you're going, maybe that dream job that you want to be at. So these are some seven different areas you could think about in setting your individual vision and kind of what it does for you. So setting that vision gives you clarity and direction. So you have a clear sense of where you're going, what is your purpose. It helps you identify goals and aspirations that help you along your path. And it really allows you to set those meaningful objectives, which all help you make decisions in the moment. In terms of motivation and inspiration, absolutely not something that's innate to all of us and not always the easiest thing. But having that vision can maybe give you motivation in those moments where you feel exhausted, you feel tired, you may be frustrated, but you know where you're going and you know what you're striving for, and that can help ignite your passion and fuel your drive to overcome the challenges or setbacks you're dealing with. Uh, the next one is really vision. Setting that vision helps to focus and prioritize your process. Um, it focuses your efforts, your actions. We all have finite resources in terms of our energy and our time. So you really wanna prioritize what are you doing now and what are you, is it working towards your vision or not? It also enables you to filter out those potential distractions, helps you make choices that align with your future and channel the energy and resources you have. In terms of personal growth and development, having a vision really pushes you to learn and acquire those new skills that bring you to that vision. And for me, I like to, for example, look at a job position of a job I want in 10 years and look at the set of competencies and think, do I have those competencies? If not, how do I get those competencies? In terms of decision-making and planning, I think this comes up through all of those, but I think it's also a point to highlight on its own. It really gives you that ability to evaluate the opportunities that come your way. So saying that like opportunity and preparation, this is part of your preparation. Does that opportunity align with your vision? In terms of networking and collaboration, again, having that vision builds up that passion, builds up that decision-making, and allows you to attract like-minded individuals who then can help create opportunities. Networking is incredibly powerful, especially in global health. And if you articulate your vision, maybe become visible to others, and then they know what you're representing. They know what you care about and what to reach out to you to collaborate on. And the final one is about resilience and adaptability. So, Having that vision really helps you navigate, again, those setbacks 
and the changes that might happen within your professional career. Maybe you have to adjust your path because something comes up and you can't overcome that challenge, but you might be able to still get back on the path and align yourself to that vision. So really what this is, what I'm saying here is that your vision provides that roadmap for your own professional journey. It guides your goals, your decisions, your actions, and it really allows you to embrace that envisioning of your future and unlocking your potential. Because now you're, you're working forward, not for that paycheck, not for the day to day, but for what you're trying to achieve in the world, what you're trying to contribute to your community. We talked about individual vision, but of course there's the importance of the collective vision. And there's a collective vision for your community. And these are different aspects that I think are important. Uh, I'm not gonna describe them all for the sense of time, but there's engagement, cooperation, again, setting that purpose, having sustainable development. This has come up in quotes from, from some of the GHMA alumni that maybe there's funding, maybe there's a new organization, but it's not sustainable. Building that resilience, the adaptability, fulfillment, and support. And it's, it really becomes a rally point that inspires collaboration, empowers all the individuals within the community. Having that shared vision can strive towards a prosperous and inclusive environment that enhances the well being of the members as well. So I think it's a very good exercise to sit and write down what your own vision is what you need, what is your path to get to that vision? And then what is your collective vision? Who is within your network? What is the collect, Johan, um, at the beginning, they showed a fantastic vision for what Johan is trying to achieve. Does that align with your own vision? So I like this, I'm gonna end the visioning um, stance with this quote from Lao Tzu which I think is very nice, very simple, that says a journey of a thousand miles starts with a single step. And while it's important to have that vision, don't forget to be in the moment. Don't forget to enjoy the process and value each step because that is your life. And while it's important to work towards a vision, it's also important to enjoy your day to day. And there's this fantastic quote from another GHMA alumni from South Africa. He says, inspiring true leadership begins not by merely envisioning African youth as future leaders, but by embracing the notion that leadership knows no timeline. Let us ignite the belief that we can be remarkable leaders and are present for leadership in a transformative journey. Very well said. I think it's really nice. It kind of touching on that concept of changing the paradigm and belief about what creates leadership. There is no timeline start to stand up and show that you're a leader. So we have about 15 minutes left and I want to invite you again to use this tool Menti. So maybe you're already there um, and maybe you're just joined in. So if you didn't see this at the beginning, we're using an online polling tool called Mentimeter and you can join by opening up a tab and going to menti.com and enter this code 4132. 5348, or you can scan this QR code with your smart device. And I will, while you're getting on there, I want to highlight this exercise. So I work in co creation and I'm very fond of different types. Oh, yeah, oh, yeah, give me, give me, give me, give me, give me, give me, give so I like to use exercises as a way to build your vision, for example. So this is an exercise called the Blue Sky Vision Exercise. It's a creative way to do forward thinking activity. You can do it as an individual or you can do it as a group. And the concept is that you're trying to envision a future scenario without limitations or constraints. So often when we try and create a vision, we start to go through our mind about all the barriers, all the things that might prevent that from happening was an activity to think if those barriers weren't there, what would I achieve? So we can't go through the full exercise, unfortunately, but there's a link and I'll share the slides where you can go and there's a script. And I encourage you to host this with your friends, your colleagues, or even go through the exercise yourself. And I'm going to go to the mentee now. And the question to you is just thinking about vision. 
very, very much off the top of your head. It doesn't have to be well articulated or anything. What's the vision you have for the future of your community? So it can be your local community, it could be your global community, it could be the African community. I'm going to put the code up for anybody that can't. If you cannot access the code, you're very welcome to unmute yourself and speak out your vision as well. And if you can't access the, so, the code, you'll see the question on menti.com. You had about 200 characters to articulate. I know it's not an easy question, so I'm going to give a few minutes for you to answer. Oh, great. We're seeing some come through. You want health equality and zero disparity in healthcare. Beautiful. Love it. You want to solve many disease issues using biotechnology. Very cool. So you're definitely embracing digitalization. You want a global vision of raising change agents. So really raising up those change agents. Wonderful. I love that. I'll give a couple more minutes. And it's all anonymous. So you can say whatever comes to mind, whatever's coming from your heart. Promote sustainable food systems. Beautiful. There are a lot of medical myths in my community here in Nigeria. My goal is to start a foundation to address different myths with medical facts. Awesome. Myth busting. Before the year runs out, I'd like to open a YouTube channel. That is a wonderful idea. I think you should definitely do that. Health literacy and education, health insurance, low access through health policy in the nation. Wonderful health literacy is so important. Definitely encouraging people to understand what they can access. Community awareness through collaborative efforts geared toward better health for everyone. Wonderful and embracing the community, empowering the community to solve infertility problems through my clinical laboratory experiment. Awesome. That kind of science is very, very valuable. We need that. Important global health via active participation using evidence-based decision-making to improve the health and sector. That is music to my ears. That's absolutely important. We have a future where investment in sub-Saharan African institution is governed by its citizens and as opposed to cor corporations in other countries. Awesome. Healthy lives and well-being for all people at all ages. Embrace and refuse free environment from incorporating biotechnology means. Better governance and leadership, infrastructure, better infrastructure, ease of life, improving economy. These are all really wonderful. I'm so happy you're engaging with this. Increase computer literacy among young minds in a productive way. Absolutely. We highlighted, or I highlighted all the values of being able to use these digital tools. So we very much need to make that accessible, make people understand how they can use them, attain the highest possible level of adequacy and proper healthcare delivery and overall well being of the society. Becoming a better place with good healthcare facilities for everyone. Wonderful. That's it. I love that. That's exactly why I got into global health. I think everyone should have good access to healthcare and be able to live a healthy life. These are really beautiful. So I'm going to let you keep putting those in. I see we're coming to nine minutes. So I just want to share one last quote. And while I'm sharing this quote, I want you to think about what is the quote that you would like to share out? What do you want to say to everyone in this room, to the youth in Africa? This is a quote from Janet. She's the current executive director of Global Health Mentorships. And her quote is, if leadership is key for universal health coverage to be achieved in sub-Saharan Africa, is it not high time attention is paid to leadership development in context specific approaches? So I'm going to open that tool again. And now there's an opportunity, if you like, to share your quote. It can be very short, it could be a sentence, it could be what you said in your vision. But is there something you want to say to everyone in this room and to anyone that sees this recording? And if you're in Menti, just make sure to Press go to slide and it'll say, what do you want to say to your peers regarding being a voice for global health equity in Africa? So I'll give a few minutes.
We have let's empower each other. Love that. Very simple, but direct, important quote that we need to lift each other up. Failure is an opportunity to more intelligently begin again. Fantastic. We have what it takes. A lot of ideas running through our minds. Just start with one idea. Such a good quote. Both really great. I definitely deal with that problem myself where you almost feel overwhelmed by the amount of ideas that are coming up and you don't know where to start. Definitely just start. Put something out there. Put your voice out there. I'm gonna give a couple more minutes. Years of mistakes is what becomes an experience. Love that, that was great. I feel like we gotta turn these all into social media quotes. Avoid distractions on the road to your vision. Very cool metaphor or analogy, love that. It starts with you and me making impacts for global equity in Africa, wonderful. If youth get involved, we have a longer time to make impact. Oh, such a great way to look at that. Actually, I didn't think about that, but that's very simple and perfect. You're starting to empower people from a younger age and they can contribute for much longer time. You aren't too small to make an impact. Don't be your own limitation. Wow, you guys are amazing. This is really good. Don't despise the days of little beginning. Be focused. Let's try to be the change we wish to see. Beautiful. I want us to create a community of change makers in health matters. Awesome, I love that. Set up that network, set up that community. The people who change the world are those that have taken impossibility out of their dictionary. I wanna put this on my wall. I love that, I very much agree. I try never to think something's impossible until maybe it's never, never impossible actually. It takes a lot to convince me something's impossible. I want us to create a community. Oh, I read that one, sorry. Stand out for the next generation to come be at your best. And the little you do would surely be remembered. Awesome, I love that. Each drop in the ocean is important. It's not too late to start now. Let's support each other. Let's live an inspiring life. You can only think, look not to your current strengths, but always focus on the reason why you first yearn for change. So really wonderful. I'm gonna leave this open, but I wanna make sure we have five minutes to get to some of the questions. So I'm just gonna put them on the screen. We have a few questions. First one is, as a medical student with interest in writing, health education, academic coaching and mentoring, and also interested in NCDs, what's the area of public health stands out to be the best? I feel you. I've dealt with the same challenge. I've done microbiology, NCDs, mentoring. I create your vision. Maybe you're that person that tries to connect all these areas to each other. So you try to understand each of them and understand what they can learn from each other. Or write out that vision and see which one, if you work towards each in your vision, maybe you wanna be the head of an NCD department, what would it take to get there? And maybe what would you lose in the process? But I think you can combine coaching and mentoring always in those areas, health education, you have to educate yourself and others if you work towards NCDs. So I really think you can make a good, a good vision around this. As a pharmacy student interested in health policy and advocacy, how do I get involved? Perfect, so start to look, you probably already have, but look at all the policies related to pharmaceuticals, Start to think about who are the big players, pharmaceutical companies that work with governments, understand how they engage with each other and where you would imagine your role to be. And then how to get involved now, I would look for those nonprofits, online networks, anyone that's looking at this intersection between policy and pharmacy, and then just start speaking up, build that knowledge. Anytime I wanna advocate something, I always want to bring up my own understanding first. So you know you're advocating for the right thing. See more coming in. So we have a couple more minutes. My vision is to create a sustainable and improved healthcare system in Nigeria. Awesome, I love that. I want healthcare to be accessible for all. Such a beautiful vision. You have a big powerful network here with you. Use them to make that a possibility. Oh, the recording has how stopped. How do we join GHME? I will send out the slides. 
We have a program starting up towards the end of this year. It's through an online This meeting is process. being recorded. You take an exam. The exam is not to say if you're good or not, but it's actually to test these attributes we match you in and your personality. You set goals, and then we match you to mentors that join our program. Uh, it's everybody that has taken it. Of course, some a few individuals don't enjoy it, but we've had a lot of good um, experiences. Oh, I'm so sorry. I'm at time. I'm going to stop there. I'll stop sharing. Thank you so much. Over to you, Erin. <laughs> Thank you, Dr. Daniel, for that wonderful presentation. We are right on time. Um, the participants that um, actually made a screenshot, and I'm just going to go ahead next. So this is from um, Uket Hassan de Unguha. Says, my question is, how will you justify this clarity and direction for a person who is just at the start stage or at the beginning of this journey? Hmm. So maybe undergraduate level, you can imagine, or just starting out. For me, I would say pick an area that kind of speaks to you the most. So if I was at the very beginning of my career, it would be the community engagement. And that's really where my career has gone. And then try and understand how you could use, for example, expanding your knowledge, seizing opportunities, and using digital structures to work towards building community engagement. I think everything in global health, unfortunately, often feels overwhelming. And there's a lot of areas of career development. And like the quote that came up, just start with something and start moving forward. I hope that answers the question. Thank you so much, Dr. Danielle. Um, we'll give one more minute for question. You can post your question in the comment section. And then um, I've learned quite a lot. If you have learned a lot, you can also post that in the comment section just to know that you've learned. I, one of the things that struck me was the church of failure. I never knew <laughs> there could be a church where employees could get, have the opportunity to share their failures. Many of times we think that failure is the end, but mm. I've come to understand now that um, you should be proud of um, of how um, what you learn from mm. um, the things you think you failed from, and that you should be proud of your unique experience. Share them confidently through digitalization, and you can use social media platforms like LinkedIn. Um, Twitter, um, yes. Then uh, one of the comments, um, Justin Bruno said, he said, "I have not failed. I'm just, I've just found ten thousand ways that won't work." <laughs> exactly. I think that that was one of the um, one, that was one of the mm -hmm. words um, Michael Faraday um, he tried so many times. Okay, amazing. I see lots of um, comments. <laughs> Thank from you. I love it. Um, Shall Damilola open me? Okay, so Damilola asked the question. I have a big vision, but my current professional level is not encouraging. Mm -hmm. Any advice, ma'am? A big mission that their current professional level is vision. not meeting. I think you need to do a visioning exercise. I think so. You have that mission, and hopefully, the mission has a goal, a goal point. If it doesn't, maybe set those. I like to think of sub objectives like, how do I build up myself towards that point? Don't think that you don't have the best professional standing now, but it's more your this is the block you're starting with and you can build on it. So for example, I applied five times till I got my PhD. I learned because those were not the right fit for me. Once I found the one that was the best fit, it was magic. So don't don't be down on yourself because you think you're not at that level yet. Like just set that vision and know what steps you need to take to get there and don't stop applying, don't give up. Thank you so much, Dr. Daniel. So young people, no more talk shops. Let's uh, become um, solution-oriented. Let's compete less and give room for more collaboration. Thank you so much, Dr. Daniel, for this um, interactive um, presentation. Um, I, um, I enjoyed myself. OK, so we'll close questions for now. And um, the next presentation will be moderated by Ruth Agai.
Roots, are you there? Over to you. Okay, I'm here. Good evening, everyone. My name is Ruth AJ from Ghana. I feel very honored to be here this evening. So our second speaker for today's session will be talking on the topic, amplifying youth voices and perspectives in global health equity. So yeah, our speaker is on the screen now. And our speaker for this session is Ambassador Kisli Odinaba. He's a trained and a biomedical scientist, a public health enthusiast with experience in health communications. He is the executive director of Block Malaria Africa Initiative. So you can imagine. And he has re received a lot of awards. And notable ones are the Ambassador of Medical Lab Science Award, which he received in 2020 sorry, which he received in 2022. Yeah. So ladies and gentlemen, help me welcome Ambassador Kingsley Odinaba as he delivers his speech. Ambassador Kingsley, over to you. Okay, thank you so much Ruth. Um, it's a pleasure to be here and I'm quite excited that, uh, <laughs> that I'm doing this with you guys this evening. Just trying to get, okay, I think I'm fine now. Yeah, it was really a pleasure um, listening to Danielle, uh, Dr. Danielle. Uh, she's, she's someone that, you know, I look up to as well in the space of global health. And she's someone that quite a lot of, um, young people, I've noticed quite a lot of young people in the global health space in Nigeria, I was also looking up to. So um, Daniel, it's good that you know that, <laughs> that we're doing, we're, doing, we're doing quite fine looking up to you and then we're enjoying the moment. So it's a pleasure uh, to uh, have listened to your session, very powerful, very impactful, and I've learned so much within the period. So um, it's a, quite an honor to be here this evening, Odinaka Kingsley. For better is my name, and I am joining this meeting from Jos, the capital city of Plateau State in Nigeria. And um, if you'd permit me, I would just want to go ahead to share my slide. Maybe post. You would want to give me permission to do that. Yeah, and just to mention, I'm also an alumni of the Global Health Mentorship, so um, I I can guarantee you for one that. One way to amplify your voice as a young person in the space of global health is to be in that mentorship, right? Um, I was um, I had one of the most amazing times uh, in the global health mentorship, and trust me, it's something that you would want to give a shot at, right? If you're truly passionate about global health, yeah. So, uh, who is giving me the permission? Who is granting me that permission to share my screen? I'm still waiting. Ambassador Kingsley, you can go ahead and share your screen. Okay, so I'm actually joining with two devices. I think you're connecting me, you're, you're sharing, you're giving permission to the wrong one. I want to believe so. The one with my video on is the one I'm requesting for. Yeah, Global Health Conversation. Huh? My goodness, some couple of years ago, young people have not, you know, like young people don't see the need to meet together and have this conversation. I'm just so excited that Johan have been able to like take deliberate action, you know, on this. And then we've been able to like create a platform where young people can meet themselves, discuss global health, discuss the challenges, discuss the progress, you know, and all that. So this is very critical at this moment. I want to say that um, this is greatly done and kudos to Johan, thank you so much for doing this it means a lot and you will soon see the impact trust me so i'm, I'm still waiting for that permission sorry 
Yeah, it doesn't say your code. Are you still? Yeah, I don't know if it's indicating that from the chat. Yeah, so I'm not a co-host, and until I'm a co-host, I'm not able to share. Maybe uh, there might be a limit on the number of co-hosts. If, if it would help you guys can make me no longer co-host, that may can. It might be the challenge. Okay, so I think the issue was making my other device a host. So I would maybe have to log out from that. So now you have one space. You can now make the only existing device a co-host. Once you do that, then we'll be fine. And I also want to commend like the uh, the number of persons on the call today. It's it's great, Johan. You have a very good network of people, and seeing that a very large percentage of these people are young people, it gives me so much excitement that I'm looking to. My guys, so <laughs> we're going to see it as it is, and we're going to we're going to communicate, you know, in the area in the language that we both understand, right? So, and Daniel has set a very wonderful uh, pace for us, so we can move on that speed. Uh, Ruth, are you able to do that? I'm, I can't still see myself as co-host. Please, I'm begging now. <laughs> Please help me. If you want, also maybe you can email me your slides because I can share the screen if it gets to the point where we can't. And then you could just say next slide, I'll do the, okay. the next. <laughs> okay. Uh, I was think, I was going to do that earlier, but then since I had the opportunity to be host, I felt it was going to help me move faster. So, but then if, if this doesn't work, that would have to be our options. Emmanuel, please, can you make him the co-host? Please, link, please, um, please, can you do something for us? Can you share the slide? Can you send the slide to our email? Okay, okay, that's fine. Let me do that now. Okay, uh, uh, while that is going on, Dr. Daniel, I'm so thankful that you're here. Um, one of the participants asked a question. Mm -hmm. He just um, sent a message privately. Yeah. Um, in its Okay, so I'll just read out the question. It says, as a medical student with interest in health education, writing, public speaking, and public speaking engagement, academic coaching, and mentoring, passionate in leadership, what's the best match for me for postgraduate studies in public health? Thank you. I, I love this because I think a lot of us in global health have so many different interests, and it definitely becomes a big challenge. It's hard for me to tell you the exact uh, match. Um, what I can say is there are, so I work in co-creation, um, which is a methodology for engaging different individuals around an issue. And that engages a lot of different skills. So it engages facilitation, coaching. I have to have an understanding of different public health threats. So that's becoming a very popular process. It's very similar to like participatory action research or community-based um, participatory research, these areas I think would work quite well for you because, um, and there's a lot of funding for it. So there's a lot of PhDs out there that are calling for this type of engagement. Another one is like public and patient involvement. So I'd say if you're at the point of a master's or a PhD, try to look for those topic areas and then you'll be able to even focus that in on these different aspects that you think are important. So hopefully that answers, but I'm, I'll also put my email in the chat. If anybody has additional questions or anything, I'm happy to engage. That would be wonderful. Thank you so much, Dr. Daniel. Okay, email is sent. Kindly confirm you received that.
yes, so we've uh... downloading now. Okay. People, please don't feel worried. This is technology. We're navigating. Sometimes it can be tricky. <laughs> so absolutely. <laughs> yeah. So you you never you never can know one hundred percent of it. Sometimes that one percent is enough to you know just show you off the border. Well, you're adapting to this mistake. Well, that was good. <laughs> <laughs> No, I'm no, fine. You're very well. <laughs> uh, okay. Hope that works. Exactly. <laughs> Any progress? Yes, we are working on it. Well, Thank you so soon. much. Your, your slide will be up. Thank you so much. Whoever will be in charge of it will have to be very fast with me as well. There are quite a lot of animations on it. Okay, so while that is coming up anyway, I already introduced myself. Odinaka Kings Yobeta is my name. And, um, you know, the conversation we're having today is one that is very critical and is one that really requires that. I, I want to believe, I was just looking through earlier, I think in the WhatsApp group, I deliberately had to register and join the WhatsApp group. And I noticed that it's not everybody necessarily in the group that is a medical person. So, or a healthcare worker or a, or a medical student, not everybody. I noticed we probably have some persons who are accountants, and we have some people who are, um, you know, social media persons, maybe social media influencers or uh, tech persons in the group, I noticed as well. So th this is why it is Global Health, right? It is open to everybody from everywhere. <laughs> you know, you are, whether you're a social scientist, whether you're, you know, funny as it sounds, you're a mechanic or an engineer, there's a place for you in Global Health. So you just have to find the intersection, you know, between what you're doing and then the healthcare problem you're passionate about or you're interested in solving or you're interested in contributing to, you know, its control or elimination. That's, you're able to cover, cover out a niche in that area and then it helps you so much, right? So um, trust me, you're in the right place and it's going to be quite interesting for us to of this conversation. I'm patiently waiting for that slide because I don't want to leave any aspect of it behind, okay? So, but then, if it's still delaying for too long, I might just need to proceed and whenever it comes up, then we'll have it. Please let me know if that's okay. Yeah, it's okay, you can continue. Okay, fantastic, thank you so much. So this evening we're discussing amplifying youth voices and perspectives in global health equity. Um, it's a very important conversation and is one that pertains to the group of people we have here. So we're young people and then this is exactly the kind of conversation that we should be finding ourselves in right so um i lead the block malaria africa initiative here in nigeria and um i think we'll share a bit about the work that we do uh, one of the key things we do is working with a lot we're working with young people you know to help support communities build resilience against malaria so we carry out quite a lot of um, community-based activities uh, we facilitate distribution of long-lasting certificate nets, we carry out sanitations, and a whole lot of that, you know. And we also contribute to policy development um, to regards to malaria elimination at country level. So that's also very important. Um, this evening, depending on where you're connecting from, it's evening in Nigeria. Um, I'll have, I have a scope of presentation that I want to take us through in a bit to help us understand the concept of amplifying youth voices you know, uh, and perspective in global health equity. 
And we'll be looking at an introduction which covers basically an introduction of who a youth is. It also covers what global health is about and then what global health equity is about. And a bit of um, light on the brand, some of the branches of global health. Quite a lot of branches make up global health, but then I'll be highlighting just a few. And then for the sake of justifying why young people have a voice in global health, I've also decided to, uh, to capture some principles of global health. There are quite a number of them, but then I think I featured about six or seven principles of global health, you know, just so that you can see these principles and then see that it covers the population youth in it or the population young people. So you have that confidence that you are not in the wrong spot or in the wrong place. Or uh, if you are interested in global health, then you're not having the wrong interest. We're also going to look at some of the existing disparities and inequalities in global health, um, just so that we're able to know why it is important for young people to rise up to begin to address uh, some of these gaps. Then we'll go straight to, you know, look at youth engagement in global health equity. We'll take a look at the importance of amplifying youth voices in global health, because this has been an argument for quite some years now. You know, it's been an argument. Uh, people wonder if it is really important for young people to be featured in global health, uh, or they just have to be there, you know. So we're going to be looking at why it is important. And then, okay, the slide is up. Yeah, so keep me on that outline. And I will say thank you from this end. Thank you. So uh, we're also going to look at the impact of youth participation. And then uh, this is not necessarily with respect to global health, but then cutting across every other aspect of life. What happens when young people are involved, you know, in solving societal issues, right? We we'll take a look at um, that. And then the challenges in promoting youth engagement. Then some of the strategies for amplifying youth voices in global health. Case studies, just a few case studies of where young people have really solved the problem in the global health space. And then I'll share some call to action, just in point, and then I would let you connect with me. And that will be all for this evening. So now that we're good, I think we're ready to fly, right? So let's go, <laughs> let's start the journey. So the, the first question here is who is a youth? Because a lot of the times people have actually had a lot of conflict defining this uh, term youth. So when we say youth, what does it mean? What comes to your mind? I want to see people sharing responses in the chat box. Let's make the session a bit participatory, right? So I give you the energy, you give me back, okay? So who is a youth? When you hear the term youth, what comes to mind? And then are you a youth as a young person? As a person on the call now, are you a youth? Is it a yes or a no, I'm a youth, I'm not. You know, let's get to hear that response, okay? Um, very fine. Let's move to the next. Okay, so just a few, aha, uh -huh, I'm seeing responses now. Anyone on that 30, 35, okay? Uh, okay, some beautiful responses are coming in. Anyone who is vibrant, enthusiastic, okay? Beautiful responses, I'm a youth, I'm 18, 35, okay? Beautiful responses, nice one. So let's look at some of the definitions here that have been featured. Uh, by the United Nations and the African Union Youth Charter. The, the, Afri the United Nations actually defines the youth as any person who falls within the age of 15 to 24 years, yes. right? Uh, that's from the lens of the United Nations. So to the United Nations, I want to believe if you fall below, if you fall uh, to 24 years, you're probably not a youth anymore, right? So, but then um, this is what we have. Uh, and then um, it is important that you know that the population of youth or young people across um, you know, the world is actually very high. We're looking at about 1.2 billion individuals, and this accounts for like 16% of the world's population. So um, this is key for you. This data is actually key so that you know that young people have a voice, right? You, you know that young people have a voice. It's very important you know that. Now, the African Union Youth Charter also defines that a young a youth is actually a person between the age of 15 to 35. So I think that is the definition that qualifies me. <laughs> that qualifies quite a lot of people on the call right now, right? <laughs> to be a youth, right? So uh, Africa has like the largest population in the, you know, of young people in the world. It has the youngest population of young people in the world. And um, about 70% about 70 of that population of young people is actually um, under the age of 30 and mostly around Sub-Saharan Africa. That's also a point you need to hold on to. Now in Nigeria, I'm I had to put this because we're here, I'm in Nigeria, right? So. <laughs> 
I'm speaking from my local context. In Nigeria, it is estimated that about 60% of the Nigerian population is made up of people below, below the age of 25, right? And Nigeria has about 20, uh, 220 million people in estimates. That's a huge number. So this message will be hitting those who are in Nigeria and hit every other person um, equally, right? So let's let's keep moving. And then we can capture, yeah, so understanding of what global health equity is about. I want to feature an explanation from global health, and then we'll go to global health equity. Uh, who is on my slide? Next, let's keep moving. Thank you so much. Fantastic. Good. So global health, um, according to Copland et al., um, is defined um, or research or an area of research or an area of practice that places a priority on improving health and achieving health equity for all people worldwide. So it's something is is a, is a term that covers the entire globe, right? So if you're, if you're building uh, a research or you're working on a research that addresses an issue that affects one part of the world or the other, or you're practicing your you know you're in medical practice and then you're contributing to health in one way that affects the world, right? You are one way or the other contributed to global health. So this is the definition that is given by Copland, and that is the definition I've chosen to stick with for the sake of this presentation. Now, health equity, um, let's look at what the WHO is saying about it from the perspective of WHO. Uh, it's described as an absence of unfair and avoidable differences in health among population groups defined socially, economically, demographically. Now, under demographically, captured on that particular area, right? and then geographically as well. Now we begin to talk about whether you're an African, whether you're from Europe, whether you're from America, you know. So what, once there is an absence of unfair, you know, unavoidable differences in health among population groups, we are looking at health equity. So if we put these definitions together, global health equity, what we're looking at now is the fact that global health is defined as a mutually beneficial and power balanced, power balanced partnerships, right? and processes which lead to equitable human environmental health outcomes as a group, at a global scale, right? So let's look at it from that perspective. Now, what are some of the branches of global health? I said there are quite a lot of branches. Uh, there are more than what you're seeing on the screen right now, but then just to feature some, biostatistics is there, public health is there, epidemiology, environmental health, ment uh, health policy and management, social and behavioral health, you know, health system strengthening, which is, Major and then recently the conversation have started up in the chat. So mental health also is a branch of global health and it's a very important one. Today we're seeing a lot of master's degree courses, for instance, you know, talk about global mental health, you know, as a master, as a postgraduate degree, right? So you could actually build confidence in that area. Yeah. So we, please move. <laughs> Thank you. So um, I said I deliberately had to feature some of the principles of global health because I wanted us to understand that as young people, we actually have a say when it comes to global health. So we have a voice because you need to first of all recognize that you have a voice before you're able to you know, talk about how to amplify that voice. The same. They, there are a number of about eight key principles, but then I think I featured about six or so on this presentation. The first is the principle of universality, which says that global health recognizes health as a fundamental human right, and assert that every individual, every individual, regardless of their background or geographical location, deserves the opportunity to achieve optimal health and well-being. So as a young person, you have what it takes to participate you know, in global health. You have what it takes to benefit from global health. You have what it takes to contribute to global health, right? According to the principle of global health, the principle of universality. Now, the second is the principle of social justice, which also says that Global health uh, equity is grounded in principles of social justice aiming to eliminate unfair and avoidable health disparities. Before I move further on that, it's, it is key that you know that as a young person, you should not be sidelined. You don't deserve to be sidelined, you know, when conversations of global health is on the table. You don't deserve to, you know, be far away from when conversations on global health is on the table because you have a role to play. And that's what this is pointing out to, right? Beside, aside being, you know, in the position to benefit from, you know, what global health has to offer, you all, right? now it calls for the redistribution of resources, opportunities, and 
and power to address underlying social, economic, and political determinants that contribute to health inequalities. So I think this other part of that definition further explains the point that I had made earlier, right? So you have a role to play, and then, and it's not just a role, it's an obligation that you owe your society, it's an obligation you owe your community. Now, there's also a principle of intersectionality, right? Now, this principle also says that global health recognizes that individuals' experiences of health disparities are shaped by multiple intersecting factors such as race, gender, age, age, my emphasis, I'm pointing out my emphasis, age, disability, and socioeconomic status. So what this is saying is you're definitely going to be <laughs> sidelined one way or the other, right? Because of your age, there's, there's always that place where, you know, you can be affected, you know, with the global health disparities, there will be inequality as a result of age. Your contribution might not be valid because of how old you are. Your, you know, your voice might not be heard because of how old you are. So know that. But you know, one of the principles that global health is pointing out here, the principle of intersectionality, is that you should not be sidelined because of your age. As a matter of fact, you should not, you know, lack access to health because of your age, and a lot of that. Okay. So let's move. I think there are a few more principles that I want to point out. Principle of participation, right, and empowerment. The global health equity promotes meaningful participation and empowerment of individuals. There is a reason why participation and empowerment is there, right? So that as you're receiving help, or as you're being impacted by global health, you also need to be giving. You also need to be contributing. It doesn't matter whether you're a health professional or a health practitioner or not, as obligation that you owe yourself, the obligations that you owe the people around you, you know, which in the other way around are contributions towards global health, right? Like taking care of your environment, taking care of yourself, eating healthy, staying healthy, you know, having good sleep, taking good water, all that is very important. Not polluting the environment, very important, right? So now you have a contribution to make, right, at your community level, in decision-making process, especially in policy development, in program implementation, that is key. Another principle of global health is tied to collaboration and partnership, that global health equity calls for collaboration and partnerships among diverse stakeholders, which include yourself as a young person, right? It includes you as a youth, including government, civil society organizations, academia, healthcare providers, and communities. So if you say health, young person is not captured in this definition, then Healthcare professional is captured. So are you a healthcare professional? It doesn't matter whether you are young or old. You future in this particular principle, right? If you're a member of a civil society organization, you future. If you're, a member, if you're a member of the academia, you future, like Daniel, for instance, right? And any other person who is um, in the academia currently, right? Now, the other principle, which is the most profound principle from the lens that I look at it, is the principle of ethics and human rights. That global health equity upholds ethical principles and human rights in health. It affirms the right to health, non-discrimination, equitable access to health services, and fair distribution of resources. I want to also add fair distribution of opportunities to that particular principle, right? Fair distribution of resources and fair distribution of opportunities. So that as young person, you should not be sidelined, you know, in the in the area of making your contribution towards global health because of how old you are. It shouldn't play a part, right? Now, it opposes any form of discrimination or stigmatization based on socioeconomic status, gender, race, or any other factors, including age, okay? Remember, including age. Now, let's look at some of the existing disparities and inequalities in global health. And this is going to help you, you know, understand why it is important for you to rise up as a young person and contribute towards, you know, the, the contribute towards global health equity. Why is it important for you to do so? We, we're starting that conversation of importance from here. We have quite a number of existing disparities and you know, inequalities when we talk about global health. We have disparities, socioeconomic disparities, people because of you know, um, their socioeconomic status not having access to health and a whole lot of other issues, right? We have the factor of you know, access to health. People lack access to health because of how much they aim or because of their, the color of their skin, because of where they are. We saw a lot of this play out during the COVID-19 uh, pandemic when vaccines are being rolled out, right? And we're still seeing this happen in different other areas in global health currently. Um, just uh, was it earlier this year or some, I think maybe last year, right? I remember the um, former acting director of the 
Africa CDC was traveling for a conference, right? I can't remember which of the countries now. And it's a European, I think European country or so. And there was a lot of visa issue and that sparked up another conversation in the internet. You understand? It sparked up another serious conversation. That if I'm supposed to be a speaker, for instance, in this conference, he was saying, uh, why do I, you know, why am I getting some of these strict visa regulations? You know, there were just too many issues. So there's also disparities around racial and ethnic disparities. We have gender inequalities or, you know, or inequities. We have social determinants of health, which are like basic when it comes to the disparities, right? We also have disease burden and infectious diseases, geographic disparities. You are an African, you are in Africa. Because you're in Africa, you can access this particular, um, you know, support from global health or this. So these are issues, right? So on the basis of these issues, every single person on this um, call, one way or the other, has been affected by one inequality or the other captured on this screen. One way or the other, you've been affected by one, right? So it's enough reason for you to stand up and lend your voice for these inequalities to be you know, fixed, for these inequalities to be adjusted, right? For things to be done right is enough reason, okay? So you don't even need to be a healthcare practitioner before you've been affected. As a normal member of the society, who doesn't have access to healthcare, you have a voice. And Global Health has given you that on the principle, you know, of, um, of its ethics and human rights. That you have access to healthcare and you need, you deserve that. So you need to lend your voice on that, right? So let's move a bit. And then we're getting a bit into the heart of the conversation. But this is just to help us, you know, understand our place in Global Health so that when we begin to talk about how you should take action, it will be clear to you that you have a ground to start from, right? So who is on my slide? Can we move? Thank you. So what does it mean if we're looking at youth engagement in global health? What does youth engagement in global health equity looks like? What does it mean, right? Um, youth engagement in global health equity, um, you know, it refers to the active and meaningful youth involvement of youth in efforts to promote health equity in the global scale. So what that means is you contributing, lending your voice to help addressing health issues, not necessarily for yourself alone, even though that counts, but as well speaking on behalf of a population or speaking on behalf of your community or speaking on behalf of your country or speaking on behalf of people who have been deprived from having access to you know, some benefits that should come with global health. So as a young person, once you're involved, you understand, once you're making efforts, you have meaningful involvement, you know, in promoting health equity on a global scale. We look at you as somebody who is, you know, who is involved in, um, you know, global health equity as a, you know, as a young person. So we see youth engagement from that perspective. Now, it encompasses the participation of young people in global health. It also encompasses the representation of young people in global health, right? Whether you're a member of um, an organization contributing to health policy, health policy development, or contributing to um, different aspects of health, you know, once you're there as a young person, you're representing. So the representation of young people, um, it's also talking about the influence of young people in decision-making processes at the global health level, right? It's talking about policy development, that as a young person, your contribution to policy development is also part of youth engagement in global health equity, right? You're talking about program implementation. Are you contributing, you know, are you solving a problem, a health challenge? or you closing a health gap in your community, right? Program implementation, if you are involved in that, you're also the person we're talking about when we refer to as youth, when we refer to youth engagement in global health equity, right? So are you contributing to research, right? Health research, are you contributing to the development of local data? You are part of what we're talking about. Are you into advocacy of any sort or, or you have a community initiative that you're part of where you also go out to lay, you know, to contribute a little bit towards making the world a better place or helping people get access to quality healthcare or quality and affordable healthcare. You're also the person we're talking about today, right? Now, youth engagement in global health equity um, recognizes one key thing, that young people have valuable perspectives. It also recognizes that young people, irrespective of their age, their gender, their race, their religion, their tribe, they have diverse experiences that is very critical to helping global health policies, you know, making the best of global health policies. Right. It also recognizes that young people have a lot of ideas, right? A lot of ideas, you know, aimed that will help shape global health policies, right? So that is already an established fact in the global health space. Now, still talking on youth engagement in global health equity, um, you know, okay, thank you. It involves 
creating platforms. When we're talking about youth engagement and global, uh, global health equity, we're looking at the, you know, the possibility or the, the, the strategies involved in creating platforms and opportunities for young people to share or air their voice or their opinion, right? So there are various experiences, you know, and also that platform created for them to deliberately contribute towards shaping global health policies, right? Or shaping global health programs or shaping global health interventions, right? And I learned quite a lot of this through the global health mentorship program um, that Daniel was talking about earlier. So <laughs> I, would, I would be sharing more later, right? Now, still talking on this, youth engagement in global health equity you know, is also a form of engagement that empowers young people. So it's not enough that young people are contributing, right, to global health. The youth, when we talk about youth engagement in global health equity, we're also looking at how is the platform created empowering the young person who is contributing to that, that policy, who is contributing to that, the success of that program. So it's not enough to want to say that, you know, I used to make this point that young, it's, it's high time that young people, you know, are are celebrated beyond just carrying placards and standing on the road and carrying placards for awareness of one health issue or the other, right? What, how exactly are you supporting this young person to build skill in project management, to build skill in advocacy, to build skill in project development, right? So youth engagement in global health equity is not just about young people contributing. It's also about young people receiving skills. It's also about young people being, having their capacities developed, right? It's also about helping young people realize their rights in health. It's also helping them realize that as, as young people, they have a stake beyond contributing. They also need to be empowered because there is a level to which young people have an experience when it comes to global health. We've had series of pandemics, you know, for instance, in several decades now, right? It takes someone who has existed in a decade before, you know, or in a century before to be able to share with you information about how things work. So as a young person trying to contribute to global health, you are entitled to receiving that mentorship. You are entitled to receiving that skill, that capacity development, right? It's a part of global health, youth engagement in global health equity, right? It also seeks to, to challenge the power of imbalances, right? It challenges the power of imbalances. Today, we look at the global health space and then it's almost as if there is a cut in generation. So you see the older generation are the ones filling in all the leadership position in, in global health, right? So you look at some of the top health initiatives and international organizations contributing to healthcare, and then everybody there, they, you find it difficult to find one young person. There is a, there is a very strong power in balance, right? So you think given in global health equity, you know, tends to the fact that there are young people in the society, in the world, that have what it takes to lead effectively they have what it takes to, you know, be in some of these positions so that they can also use their experience, use their energy, their innovation and creativity and contribute towards, you know, solving some of the biggest global health issues in the world from that particular position, right? So it promotes inclusivity. It also amplifies the voices of the young people, right? You know, through diverse methods, okay? Now, by involving youth in global health equity initiatives, we, one thing we do is that we harness their energy, we harness their innovation. We also create a platform for them to make commitments, to drive positive change, right? And create more equitable and just world, especially as because we're talking, we're talking about health, right? So when we try to amplify young people's uh, perspective, when we try to amplify young people's voice, right? We're giving them that platform to drive change. We're giving them that platform to bring in their innovation and energy, right? And that is what youth engagement in global health equity is, you know, is all about. And that is key. Now, I talked about how we're going to look at impact of youth participation. And I said this is not necessarily tied to, it's not necessarily tied to uh, global health, but then we're going to look at it holistically, right? That as a young person, right? As a young person, when you participate in things, when you participate in solving challenges or solving problems, how does this participation impact you as a person? How does this participation impact your social, your sociability, right? How does it impact the system or the society that you belong to, right? So this is what this is about. So at an individual level, your participation in solving challenge or solving problems, right, helps to increase your knowledge as a young person. It helps to broaden your understanding about that, that issue you're solving then it helps you to also build personal skills, right? It helps you to make healthy choices, 
and it also helps you to have a sense of identity. It helps to have, a, you know, to have good self-esteem. This is also part of some of those things we point out to when we encourage you to volunteer, for instance, that in the course of volunteering, right, you build personal skills, you develop healthy choices, you have a very good self-esteem. So at the personal level, this is what is happening to you because you're seeing one problem and then you're rising up to the occasion to want to contribute towards solving this problem, right? Now, what happens to you at the social level, right? At the social level, you tend to build strong, positive connection with friends and adults. You develop a, you know, you develop a good network that supports your journey in global health, that supports your journey in politics, that supports your journey in the academia. It depends on which area you intend to be contributing, right? You build that strong, positive connection with friends and adults. With you know, you you have that community ownership. You have that community responsibility. You know that you have a a, a uh, what do you call it? You have a part to play for your community to be better. You have a part to play for the society to be better, right? Now, you also have this um, impact that is made at the system level, right? Now, what this is also saying is that greater civic engagement, as a young person, greater civic engagement, you know, um, your contribution to solving problems helps you to attain greater civic engagement, you know, in the areas of policy and programs, right? It also creates a platform for you to contribute towards, you know, governance in different ways, right? You contribute to governance, you contribute to policy development. You, so your participation in solving the world's challenges affects the system positively. It helps to bet a better system. It helps to bet a better leadership. It helps to bet better solutions, right? So that you don't just have impact on your, the, the impact is not just ha, ha, you know, made on you. It's also made on your social level. It also made on the level that, on the level of the, right, or the leadership around you, okay? So let's look at some of the importance of amplifying youth voices and perspectives. Because we've talked about, you know, <laughs> we've talked about how young people have a voice in global health to start with, right? We've talked about how your voice is needed because there are a lot of, you know, inequalities, there are a lot of disparities in global health that need us to rise up to the occasion to address. So. Why is it important for you to really have your voice amplified as a young person? Why is it important for my voice to be amplified as a young person? The first point I'll be, I, I think I have about nine points on this, all right? About nine points. The first is, the, is sustainable change and intergenerational equity. Um, two days ago, I think I was on a platform and we're having a webinar and I was discussing how, uh, what, I was discussing the role of young people, right? In contributing towards sustainable financing for malaria elimination right, in Africa. And one of the things I said in that meeting was that young people, because we are young, we tend to inherit challenges and problems that we have no business with, right? Now, if we're going to be inheriting challenges and problems, why don't we inherit solutions as well? Why is the generation before us not deliberate about making sure that we as well inherit solutions, knowing fully well that we're going to be inheriting challenges, right? So by involving youth in global health equity, one thing that we're doing is that we are empowering them to become agents of change, right? We are, by amplifying their voices as well, we're creating a foundation, right, for sustainable effort. So if the generation before the current generation, you know, had been able to make an effort to help, let's say, fight cancer, and they've gotten 60% by um, Amplifying the voices of young people who are coming, you're able to have them continue with this impact, you know, and it becomes a transgenerational impact, right? And then the, the, the solution that is being provided is sustained across a generation. It's sustained even to the next generation. And as far as, you know, the next generation keep having their voices amplified, the solution to these challenges that befell the world will continue to keep, you know, it will, it will keep being amplified going forward, right? So that is important. Now, Another point is bridging the knowledge gap. Young people are often early adopters of technology and have a strong grasp of digital platforms. That, that one, we can't argue that. That's, that's a clear fact, right? <laughs> that's a very clear fact, right? A lot of us have found ourselves in a situation where we are teaching our parents how to use one or two technological apps, right? So this is a clear fact. So by amplifying the voices of young people in global health equity, you know, one thing we do is that we facilitate the use of technology we create a platform for young people to be able to use technology, you know, to solve health challenges, to address global health issues, 
right? And that is very important. We create that platform for them to use technology to educate communities, to promote behavioral change, you know, to disseminate vital health information. And this is the reason behind a lot of the health initiatives you're seeing in the global health space happening. The, the um, African, C African CDC, you know, uh, COVID-19 Bingwa program, for instance, that is on right now, the Alma Youth Advisory Council program uh, that is on, the Malaria Youth Army program, and a lot of things that is tied. So young people, when brought in, when, when given that opportunity for their voice to be amplified, what they do or what we do and what we're used to doing is bringing all the energy to the table. So everything we know how to do, we bring it and we try to be innovative about using it to solve that, show, that problem. Now, increased participation is another key thing, right? That the importance of amplifying youth voices and perspective is to have increased participation of the population of young people we have in the society. It's very key, right? So looking at, saying that we have over 1.2 billion, you know, young people in the world, or saying that, you know, um, Africa has about 60% of its population as young people, for instance, is, 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 is huge, right? So if we amplify the voices of young people and we amplify their perspective, we're giving this large number of people the opportunity to come on board and, you know, put their effort towards addressing that issue, right? So by, by highlighting and amplifying youth voices and perspectives in global health equity, we create opportunities for meaningful participation, which will help to foster innovation and then promote work towards a more equitable and inclusive and sustainable future for all of us. It's very key, right? So now another point here is having a great representation and inclusion of this population that we're talking about. We talk about youth inclusion a lot of the time. In fact, youth inclusion had been a conversation for a couple of years now. Right now, we're beginning to see a practical approach to youth inclusion because organizations, governments, you know, and a lot of agencies are beginning to take deliberate action towards youth inclusion, right? And I have some proofs to show you uh, before we get towards the end of the session, right? Now, amplifying youth voices and perspectives, um, you know, that young people, it ensures that young people who are directly affected by health disparities have a seat on the table. Um, you know, when we started malaria advocacy, for instance, because I, I'm a malaria advocate, I'm passionate about the fight against malaria. And, you know, when we started the journey for youth inclusion and the fight against malaria, one of the things that we, sh we shared as a point to our government and then to CSOs and every other person who was ready to listen was that malaria affects young people the most. Children under the age of five are the ones dying every year from this disease. They are the highest population that die from this disease. Young people have been affected. They stop going to school when they're done with malaria. You know, they, they stop going to work when they're done with malaria. They can't play. They can't have a life because they are sick, right? If this affects this population of young people, why are they not given an opportunity to make deliberate contribution towards its elimination, right? So this became a conversation, and we kept trending this conversation while we were pushing this, while we are advocating for youth inclusion uh, in the fight against malaria from Nigeria. Uh, my brother Alois and a whole lot of other young people in Tanzania were doing the same from Tanzania. The same thing was happening in Uganda. The same thing was happening in a couple of other countries, right? And it got to the point where our voices, you know, was heard. It got to the point where someone took a listing and someone had to take an action. And today we are beginning to see some very drastic change happening. Young people are beginning to get involved in this, uh, in this fight. And we've seen rapid success because of young people participation the fight against malaria within the space of four years, right? So now this justifies that. This, you know, the generation before the current generation or the generation before the generation that call themselves young people or that accept the term young people, right? Have a lot of ideas and solutions that they've been deploying over time. Quite a number of these solutions or innovative solutions to some of the health challenges or some of the challenges in global health have not really been so effective. You know, some have not been so effective. Some have been effective while it lasted, but right now they are failing as a result of a lot of changes in the air, right? Things like antimicrobial resistance, you understand? Anti-malaria drug resistance and a whole lot of things are beginning to emerge right now in the current dispensation, right? So amplifying youth voices and perspective in global health right now Create a platform where fresh perspective and innovative solutions are brought to the table to help address some of these issues that are rising. So young people bring unique perspective, creative ideas, and innovative approaches to, towards addressing these health disparities. It's a very important factor, right? 
I, last month, I spent quite a lot of, I had quite a lot of session with young people who are professionals in the medical, uh, in the medical space. I had sessions with pharmacy students, I had sessions with practicing pharmacists at different levels, talking to them about how they need to start becoming deliberate about contributing towards global health, right? That is not enough to practice your profession. That is good. You're already doing a lot. But how can you identify, have you been able to sit down to like point out some of the gaps that some of the challenges that are emerging in the global health space and then tailor your research towards addressing these gaps? It's very important, right? Bring in your new ideas. How do we fix the issue of antimicrobial resistance? How do we, uh, antimicrobial drug resistance? How do we fix the issue of antimalarial drug resistance? As a pharmacist, are you thinking towards that direction? Right? It is key. Bring in your fresh perspective because what we've been using over the years is failing. Now, amplifying youth voices also gives relevance to the youth population. Young people, we feel sidelined and we, we find it so easy to just say, hey, you have left us behind, right? We find it so easy. You don't include us in things. You don't talk to us, even at the family level. Parents sometimes don't even listen to their kids and then it becomes a huge problem, you know? The children begin to feel as if they've been sidelined. It becomes a huge So amplifying youth voices creates that platform for young people to have relevance, right? It creates that platform for them to feel as if they have, a, you know, they, to feel among, right? It creates that platform for them to feel like they have something to say. And that is very critical, okay? Let's move to the last three um, important that I've highlighted for this uh, session. And these points are equally very important, very, very important, right? Now, we keep saying young people should build capacity and young people deserve to build capacity. But it is important to note that it is in amplifying youth voices and their perspective, especially in the space of global health, that young people see the platform to build their capacity, right? I was, I was in a meeting. Okay, I, I attended for the very first time the um, African Union Pre Youth Summit earlier this year, and we're asked to draft a position paper. That would be the first time I would find myself in a situation where I, you know, I need to draft a position paper. Now I had to go start reading about what a position paper is about, how I need to go about drafting it, and all that. And then I was able to make a fantastic presentation, you know, at the end of the day of my of my position paper, and I got a lot of um, feedback in that regard. In the areas where I needed to improve. I was also told and empowered, and then I was able to also go back and build capacity in that area and then improve, right? So if, for instance, I've not, given, I've not been given that opportunity to participate in that summit, if I've not been selected for that summit, how would I have come across the concept of a position paper, for instance? And how would I have developed the capacity to be able to know how to develop one or how to write one, right? This applies to different skills, diverse skills in the global health space, right? That by amplifying youth voices, we are empowering young individuals or young people or youth to take ownership of their health and to become advocates for people. We're engaging them in skill development. We're creating opportunities that will help to enhance their capacity and help them be, you know, become better equipped towards addressing health disparities, a lot of which we mentioned earlier, right? Now, social and political transformation is also another key important for why young people's voices need to be amplified, right? So youth engagement in global health equity can have a very broad social and political implication, right? It has quite a lot of a political, social and political implications. By amplifying youth voices, we foster social mobilization. We create a platform for young people to become active, right? And then by so doing, they, they get some form of social and political relevance, right? And by so doing, they're able to also build capacity to fit into the leadership roles that is going to be <laughs> vacant within a couple of years or a couple of decades in the future, right? So this is very important. Human rights and social justice is also another important factor for why social, uh, for why, you know, youth voices need to be amplified. Because by amplifying youth voices, right, we're able to create that platform for young people to access quality healthcare. We create that platform for them to have a safe environment to live. We create that platform for them to have equal opportunities, you know, for health and well-being. We created a platform to ensure that health equity is pursued with a focus on justice and fairness. So young people are not going to be sidelined because they are young. They are rather going to have that. They are going to feel, you know, they're going to feel like belonging. They're going to have that sense of belonging. They're going to feel that oneness. They're going to feel that concept of universal health care or universal health coverage, right? So it's very, very important. So we have to amplify voices and perspective. And it's not even a question right? It's not even a question. It's not even, a, it's not even up for argument. It's a fact. We need to, 
we need to. Young people need, need to have relevance. Young people need to have their capacity built. Young people need to contribute. And until their voices are amplified, that cannot be done, right? So what is the role of youth in addressing health equity? When we're talking about, right, we've talked about how, yeah, in the course of contributing, you also need to be empowered and all that. How do you contribute? Let's talk about how areas of contribution for young people, right, over the past um, maybe one decade now, right, to the best of my knowledge. There has never been a group of people or a generation of people that have made so much impact at the community level beyond young people. Youths own the community. Youths are the community. Youths drive the social change in the community. So be it a good, a, a positive change or a negative change, once it gets into the hand of young people, they drive the process. So it is up for the generation ahead of us to give us that platform Once that is done, right from the community level down to the, you know, that's what we've been doing for the past decade, for the past decade, right? We drive community engagement. Education and empowerment, we provide awareness. We lead, you know, we, we lead awareness campaigns. We carry out a lot of, you know, engagement at community level, empowering the people at the community with information, you know, on how to live healthy, on the kind of life choices to make, you know, in order to, to have a good health, you know, and a lot of that. Technology and innovation. A lot of young people are beginning to create a lot of, you know, e-health devices, e-health apps that are helping to promote quality access to healthcare or access to quality healthcare, right? Collaboration and partnership. What Johan is doing, for instance, connecting young people from Ghana, from, you know, Rwanda, from Nigeria, from Mozambique, from Zimbabwe, from different parts of, you know, the African continent and even beyond to have conversations like this through collaborations and partnership, right? Peer education and support. I'm a young person. I'm having this conversation with you. <laughs> Daniel, I know Daniel also falls into this category of young persons. Tomorrow, um, you know, you have an array of two powerful speakers who are also young people who are also going to be discussing on these issues, right? We're able to, you know, share the knowledge with each other, even as we move, as we grow, as we access more opportunities, we create room for more young people to get into that, that opportunity, right? Long-term commitment. Because we are young, once we make a commitment to a particular course, we're able to drive the solution for that particular course for a very long period of time. We're able to have a sustainable impact over a very long period of time, right? And I can't overemphasize advocacy and awareness. So young people have a lot of role to play. If you're not contributing to community engagement, you're contributing towards education and empowerment. You're, if you're not doing that, you're contributing through technology and innovation towards solving issues of um, you know, addressing health equity. Whichever one you're doing, you're making a very critical contribution and then your contribution is valid. As a young person, your contribution is valid. You need to know that, right? So let's move. We have some key challenges that over the years we've noticed are affecting young people's contribution or, you know, is, a, is, all, is, is serving as a barrier to the amplification of young people's voice in the global health space. I took my time to look at this and I'm like, yes, this has to be part of the conversation and we really need to look at this critically. I already mentioned the issue of power imbalance, where I defined a situation where a lot of the leadership, you know, for some of the, you know, global health firms or global health agencies or international agencies, in fact, even in country level, at in country level or at national level, you discover that even government offices or political appointments at the highest level are made, you know, are filled with people the older generation, right? People from the older generation. So young people need to find, they need, they need to be a place for young people to step in. They need to be a place for young people to play a role, right? It's critical. So when that power imbalance is a limitation for why young people's voices are not heard. So until we become deliberate about creating that balance, young people might not be really, might not be able to contribute as much as they would want to towards addressing the issue, the issues we have in the global health space, right? There's also limited represent, representation of young people in the global health space. Until recently, we, you know, that we're seeing the, the, you know, the creation of youth advisory councils for a lot of the issues. We're beginning to see youth champions program emanate for a lot of health courses in the, in the, in the global health space. It has not been like that in the past. And as a result of limited representation, 
the voices of young people in the way it should be interpreted are not being presented. And this is a very serious issue. So there's limited representation of young people in the global health space. And this is part of the reasons why young people's voices are not being amplified, right? It's a challenge that needs to be addressed. There's also lack of awareness and capacity. A lot of the young people don't even know that they have a role to play in global health. A lot of the young people don't even know that they, they have a contribution to make towards making the world a better place. They don't personalize it. For some of us, it has become a thing of passion. It has become so, we are so passionate about it that you can't convince us otherwise. I know that because I'm existing in the earth, I have a responsibility to take good care of the earth. I have a responsibility to take good care of myself because I'm expecting another generation to come and meet the earth better than I met, I met it or better than I left it, right? So young people need to have that understanding. They, they, they have a role to play and they have to become aware. There has to be that self-awareness, right? And that is key. They all, and as a result of that, they need to also start understanding that the awareness is not enough. They need to build capacity. We need to build capacity as young people because the opportunities we're looking for, the positions we want to occupy, the places where we think our voices need to be heard, we need to use the right language. We need, to, we need to make the right submissions, right? So it is important that we develop capacity. So a lack of capacity is also a big problem. Hindering youth voices in the global health space. We also have issues of limited funding and resources for young people's development in the global health space. It's also another big problem, right? There's limited funding for young people to, you know, to build capacity. There's limited funding for young people to participate in global health, and there's a lot of issues. Then there's the issue of stereotyping and ageism where you make a submission in a meeting and then they say he's a young person, he doesn't know what he's saying. What do you know at your age? You know that issue? I don't know how many of us have had that. If you've been in a space where, <laughs> where you made a contribution and then your contribution was, was downplayed because, of, because you're a young person, even though you, mean, you made a meaningful contribution. If you've been in such a place, please let me see you say something in the chat, right? I know a lot of young people have been in that position and it is very sad. I've been there before. I know what the feeling looks like. It is terrible. It is very hot. When you consciously look at a situation and then you're able to make a contribution and say, okay, I think this can be done this way. But then because you're a young person, your opinion is considered not to matter in such a meeting. So it's a very serious issue, right? So stereotyping is also another challenge that is affecting young people. Then I think, um, aha, then, <laughs> yes, you know, <laughs> Daniel is maybe saying that she, she has been there. Right when she started at, w, at, at the WHO, you as a young person in global health space, if you've made some few progress, there's no way you will tell me you've not had this situation happen to you before, right? And it's quite unfortunate, right? Then I think Danielle also mentioned in the presentation, and I think I overheard her say something about um, engagement fatigue is a serious problem. It's a very serious problem. Young people get fatigued. You know, uh, you can you you walk and then you get you keep walking. You forget the place of rest. It becomes a challenge. It's a serious issue, right? Now, um, there's also a fear of telling their stories. Young people have the fear of telling their stories. And I'm so glad. In fact, this is coming in. And then I'm just <laughs> recalling some of the submissions that Danielle made earlier. And yet, you know, they're connecting, right? So you own your story and nobody can tell it better than you. You own your idea and nobody has that idea. Nobody can ever implement it better than you. If you know what we need to do to fight cancer, come out and tell us. If you know what we need to do to be able to address the issue of hepatitis, come out and tell us. If you know what we need to do for us to address the issue of tuberculosis, why are you still sitting there? Why are you not saying anything about it, right? Come up with your ideas, implement it, take up that challenge and make a contribution, right? Then young people also have this lack of networking and collaboration. Until recently, we've not seen, in fact, I think recently we're beginning to see a surge of young people beginning to collaborate, beginning to hold on, you know, support each other and help to push each other, you know, towards advancing in the, in the area of global health. It has not been like that in the past. And it's been a very serious challenge hindering the voices of young people in the global health space, right? It's been a huge challenge. So we need to start building networking capacities. We need to start collaborating with ourselves. I sh if I'm in Nigeria, for instance, I should be able to conveniently collaborate to someone, a young person in London, a young person in, in Niger, a young person in Tanzania, a young person in whichever, which other part of the country, Argentina, to work on something. And I've been doing that for a couple of years, and I can tell you, there's nothing that is as effective 
as effect as, as networking and collaboration in the global health space. It, it gives you, it gives you like it empowers you so much. I can't just quantify it, right? It's very important. So these are some of the challenges we're facing and we need to address them. So let's make a let's be, let's make a bit of effort uh, going forward. So now there's what we call the ladder of youth voice, right? Okay, so before you okay, fine. Okay, that's okay. <laughs> so before you um we, there's what we call the ladder of youth voice. It's a, it's a very critical um, conversation, right? Uh, it's a very critical conversation. Now, the ladder of youth voice, you know, is such that it defines the different level that young people are able to move from being a young person to becoming an adult in the whichever space, be it global health, be it any other space, right? So it creates, it gives, it shows you a picture of how you, of example, of how this ladder operates. So step one, what you're seeing there is manipulation. So as a young person, you step into the global health space, for instance, then you are at that level where you are being manipulated. Let's go and do this. You are all over the place. Let's go and do this. It's more like you don't have a sense of direction. You're moving without a sense of direction at that level, right? Now you grow into the point of decoration where every little effort you make they celebrate you, they say, wow, you have tried, well done, you're a young person, you're doing, ah, you are trying, you're doing, making a lot of effort, right? You're being celebrated, you're being decorated at that level. You are growing. I know while I'm explaining this, somebody's going to be picturing themselves in this, in this journey, right? <laughs> so then you get to step three, right? Where you're able to, with, with the effort you're making, someone is able to say, okay, because you made this much effort, take this stipend or take this, uh, this, this money for data or take this money for your transport because of how much you've contributed. We want to employ you and give you this job. We want to employ you and give you this. Do you understand? So you grow to that level. Then you move from there, and then you get to the point where you realize that, ha, ah, as a young person, I truly have what it takes to make a contribution, and I need to be given the opportunity to truly make a contribution, right? So you're now informed of your role as a young person. You're not informed of your relevance. You're not informed of how much you can actually contribute towards the global health space, right? And then you begin to advocate for you, for, for youth voice to be consulted, right? So anytime there's any attention being drawn to any issue, you're asking, you're, you're, what, what you're saying at that point is, what, have you made a consideration for young persons? Have you made a consideration for the youth? Have you made a consideration for what, how this issue is going to affect young people. So you become an advocate, you know, advocating for youth inclusion. You become an advocate pushing for young people to do the right, for, for, uh, for young people to be included, to make deliberate effort, do you understand, to be included. So you move from there, you grow to the point where it's almost as if you are still a youth or, you know, you are in between being a youth and an adult, right? Now you are creating this, that balance happening gradually, right? We're beginning to see that happen right now on a general level. These young people are beginning to get that balance a little by little by little, right? They are being included. There's a bit of youth, you know, it, there's a bit of equality happening now, right? Then you get to this point where you are completely youth driven. You are so passionate about youth inclusion. You are so keen. You want to keep pushing. You want to keep working. Do you understand? You get to that level. Then finally, you are at the you are the highest cadre of global health equity, right? Where you are now deliberate about like things are now happening. You are now seeing policy document being developed with youth inclusion without anybody carrying placard to advocate for it. We are now seeing, you know, decisions being made without anybody, you know, decision being made with young people in mind, without anybody coming to enforce that it must be made, right? So you get to that point. So now, looking at this ladder and then looking at some of the points here, what do we need to do in order to address some of the challenges we had highlighted previously? What do we need to do? We need to start creating platforms and spaces for youth participation. We need to start creating platforms for young people to be engaged. We need to start promoting mentorship and skill building. Like what the Global Health Mentorship Program is doing is so fantastic. Do you understand? It's a very direct form of mentorship that empowers you so much. I, I was, see, oh my goodness. I, I can't just, I just, I know, I know, I know. I am 100% sure that I have other persons who have gone through the Global Health Mentorship Program in this platform, right? So I'm not over-exaggerating, but then trust me, it just shapes you so much. So we need to promote mentorship. The, the older generation need to start becoming deliberate about passing down the skills that they have to the younger generation. They need to start connecting them with the right opportunities in the global health space. That needs to start happening. 
We need to start investing in youth-led initiatives. Johan, for instance, should not be looking for grants to carry out workshops or conferences or trainings for this. Because it is Johan, because there are young people involved in Johan, because it is a youth-led initiative, there should be a funding available for this to continue for, for it to be a monthly program, for instance, right? We need to start fostering intergenerational collaboration. We need to become deliberate about learning from the, the generation that have gone ahead of us. And that generation also needs to become deliberate about investing in the lives of the young people coming to take after them, right? Then we need to start ensuring the inclusion of young people or youth, their, the, perception, the perspectives of young people in the policies that we're making, in the decision-making processes that we get involved with in the global health space. It is very important. So this needs to be done. Um, let's, let's go forward and then let's look at some of the strategies. We are approaching towards the end of the session, of the session, right? Now, what are some of the strategies that we need to use or we need to do or we need to implement, right, to amplify youth voices and perspectives? The first strategy there is to enhance youth participation in global health. I talked about it already, right? Now, in doing this, we need to ensure that youth representation in policy making and governance is effective. Youth representation in policy making and in governance, be it at local level, at national level, at regional level, continental or global level, it needs to be done. We need to start involving young people in program planning and implementation. They need young people need to start knowing how international conferences are planned, right? We need to know how the WHO holds the uh, WHO um, Health Assembly. We need to start knowing these things. The World Health Assembly, how is it organized? Young people need to be involved, right? We need to start learning these things, right? Then we need to promote youth-led initiatives and organizations by supporting youth-led advocacy and activism, by fostering youth-led research and innovation. Let's support young people who are into research. Create that platform for them to grow. If there are challenges they don't have, they are facing, let the older generation be there to provide the guidance, right? The global health space should not be a competition for us. It should not be a space for competition. It should not be a space for fight. It should not be a space for quarrel, right? We should be working because the earth and the generation to come is depending on us to keep this environment safe, to keep the health system solid so that they can meet up something they can work with, right? Next slide. So, yes, we also need to strengthen youth, participate, youth, part, uh, youth partnerships and collaboration, right? We need to strengthen youth partnerships and collaboration by engaging youth organizations and networks in, in, in events, in programs, in, in projects that we implement in communities at whichever level. Let's engage youth organizations and networks. And luckily, we are beginning to have a lot of youth organizations or youth-led organizations emerge at different community levels, right? So we need to start engaging them from that level and empowering them, right? We need to establish intergenerational partnership for mentorship and guidance. I said this earlier, right? Though I mentioned, I, I, I mentioned some points that we can use to address the challenges highlighted, but these are strategies, so it is more in the strategy format, right? So, <laughs> so we need to start utilizing technology and digital platforms as well. By leveraging social media for youth mobilization and awareness, and by harnessing digital tools for youth-led health interventions, we need to start doing this. It's very important, right? So next slide. Now. Just, I had, I had to take out two case studies, right, for us to take a look at um, with respect to, um, you know, the successful contribution of young people or youth-led initiatives to global health equity. I need to point out two key things. Now, the first case study here that I want us to look at is the African Union Youth Front on COVID-19 that was established by the African Union, um, you know, a youth envoy, right, in 2020. Okay? Now, this was an initiative that was launched by the African Union Youth Envoy in collaboration with various youth organizations and stakeholders across the African continent. Let's take a look at some of the mandates that they adopted in 2020 and how they contributed towards helping to address COVID-19 at the African continent's level. The first was that that youth front, the African Union Youth Front on COVID-19, you know, um, had a mandate to promote awareness and education on COVID-19. So they did a lot of this across the African continent, the 55 countries in Africa, right? And that had a huge impact on people getting to know what COVID was about, knowing how to prevent COVID, and then knowing, understanding the concept of lockdown and all those terminologies. This helped to achieve that. They also have mandate for youth engagement and advocacy, right? They helped to create a platform to amplify youth voices and then they also empower young people to become advocates for policies, discussions, and decision-making processes with regards to COVID-19. That same youth fund also recognized the 
mental and well, mental health and well-being of young people in the African continent, right? Especially during the COVID-19 pandemic. So they promoted the well, mental well-being of young people in the African continent through a lot of awareness campaign, online support groups. Too many, too many things were done in that process, right? Now they had they have a mandate as well for youth-led research and innovation. So they encourage a lot of youth-led research initiative. And these conversations, I was I had a contribution to research wise, you know, during the COVID-19 pandemic. And I know quite a lot of young people who are young researchers who had published a lot of papers, you know, uh, talking about COVID-19 from the context of their community. This was part of the mandate of the African Union Youth Front in COVID-19, right? And they also encourage they also have a mandate of collaboration and partnership. Now, Africa was able to surmount the challenge of COVID-19. We're giving credit today to a lot of people, but how many times have you had the credit being given to the young people? Now, I'm sure that a lot of us on this call are getting to know about the African Union Youth Front of COVID-19 for the very first time. But this was a very strong initiative that operated during the COVID, uh, the nick of the COVID pandemic. And they helped to solve the issue of, you know, um, they helped to address misinformation and disinformation across the COVID across the, the African continent during the nick of COVID, right? Because it is a network of young people and youth-led organizations across the 55 countries of Africa. It was a lot. Now, so if you're asking me what do young people need have to offer in the global health space, I've told, I've just shown you how young people in Africa helped Africa to overcome the COVID-19 pandemic. If that is what you're asking, I just gave you that answer. Right? So it is very important, right? So let's move to the next. Another example that is going to thrill you, right? The second case study I'm giving here is the case study of the first ever Alma Youth Advisory Council, the African Leaders Malaria Alliance Youth Advisory Council. Remember when I was talking about how young people started to advocate for youth inclusion in the fight against malaria from Nigeria, from Tanzania, from Namibia, and a whole lot of others, right? Now, the African Leaders Malaria Alliance, which is the coalition of you know, the 55 African heads of state and their government, you know, um, coming together to, you know, to help address the fight against malaria from a continental standpoint. They took a decision to establish the first ever youth advisory council that would ever exist anywhere on the fight against malaria, right? And that was done in 2021, okay? Some of the responsibilities of the youth advisory council was to advise ALMA on how to ensure youth participation in advocacy for malaria at continental, regional, and national levels, to serve as malaria and universal healthcare ambassadors, to provide guidance on implementation plans for national youth armies, to participate in continental, regional, and national forums and meetings on malaria and universal health coverage, and then to produce an assessment report every two years on the effectiveness of the ALMA youth strategy, which, by the way, they also helped to develop, you know, and then they also helped, they, they, they provide this assessment report, which covers the effectiveness of the strategy, the implementation, and then they also make recommendation on the improvement of this strategy. It will interest you to know that through the work of the Youth Advisory Council, for instance, you know, across the African continent, we've been able to establish like 48 malaria, national malaria armies across 48 countries within the space of two years, right? So if you're asking me how much can young people contribute to the global health space, I'm showing you how a team of 11 young people who formed the Alma Youth Advisory Council through the support of Alma, through the coordination of Alma itself, have been able to establish 48 national youth armies across 48 countries in Africa. How they've been able to mobilize close to about 5,000 young people to become passionate about malaria, and then these young people are beginning to take actions and create innovative solutions to help address malaria across the African continent. So these young people have created hope. Now we believe that malaria can be eliminated in Africa. Now we believe, believe that zero malaria is truly achievable in Africa because we are beginning to see more hands on them, right? So this is another example of a successful youth-led initiative for global health equity in the African continent. Okay, so let's move a little, coming towards the end of this session. Okay, good. Sometime, um, sometime in 2022, the African Union, right, through the African Union, um, the, the African Union Health, um, Youth Commission, right, was able to establish the first ever African Union Malaria Conversation Guide for Youth in Africa. This is a, stra this is a strategy document that, that empowers young people at community level, at 
you know, um, leadership level and at any other level with knowledge on how they can contribute towards the fight against malaria. It is a very detailed document. You can download it online. It's interesting to know that it was developed by young people in Africa. This document, right? It's a policy document and it was developed by young people in Africa. The first ever conversation guide is a very powerful document. So young people have made contribution even at this level, okay? Let's move to the next slide. I think what I have here mostly are examples here and there, right? This was also a very, a, 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 um, I don't know, quite a number of us probably have an idea about the Kigali Malaria Summit that held in Rwanda last year in 2022, right? That held immediately after the Commonwealth Head of Government meeting in, in Rwanda. This is a crop of young people, all passionate about malaria, all contribute towards the fight against malaria at different level across the Commonwealth, right? They represent different countries across the Commonwealth and they're here. They were right there on the podium in front of the entire world advocating for zero malaria, advocating for increased commitment to the seventh replenishment of the global fund, advocating for increased investment for malaria elimination, advocating for increased investment for, you know, for NTD, NTDs and elimination, right? So this was a team of young people. Before these young people, you have the likes of the DJ or the WHO, you have President Paul Kagame, you have quite a number of you know, presidents seated here, you have quite a lot of people here, right? So if you're asking me what young people have to say in the global health space and why their voices need to be amplified, I'm just carefully taking you through quality examples that you should come to realize that the people doing these things are not too headed, right? <laughs> they are young people and you can see from their faces, you can see from the pictures, they are young people, their picture had to be here, right? Let's move to the next slide. You know, I'm glad that quite a number of the organizations at the international level are beginning to make changes in their programming. They're beginning to become deliberate about young people inclusion in the fight against, you know, malaria, in the fight against tuberculosis, in the fight against and organizations, international organizations make adjustment, you know, to their programming and include youth voices in their conversation. Right. So this flyer was I just chose to share it. I don't know why it came to mind. And I said, let me share with you. Right. But this was an event that held on the 23rd of May, like three days ago. Right. And it was hosted by the, uh, the African Institute for Development Policy in Kenya. Right. This event was um, was focused on addressing the question, what should African countries do to ensure investment and sustainable financing mechanisms for malaria elimination? From the picture of the speakers you see or the panelists you see, you know there's a young person on the, on, on the block, right? You know there's a young person on the block. And the young person is definitely going to be making a contribution as a young person. The young person is definitely going to be speaking from the perspective of a young person, right? So the question thrown at me in this meeting was, how do you think young people can contribute? Do you understand? Towards advocacy efforts and then towards a sustainable towards developing a sustainable financing mechanism for malaria elimination in Africa, right? And I give a quality response, which I want to believe represented the responses of all the young um, malaria advocates across the African continent, right? So that was important, right? So let's move to the next slide. Another example of you know another situation where there was deliberate concentration of young people in a platform. This has not been in the past. We're seeing this has happened like maybe like two years ago to now, in fact, it's beginning to get more effective every day because our voices are rising. Do you understand? If you look at this flyer, this was a tweet chat that was held by um, Malaria Consortium just yesterday from 9 a.m. in the morning, Nigerian time to about 5 p.m., right? I think 8 p.m. to like 4 p.m., right? Now, if you look at the flyer, you see young people there, myself and Crystal, uh, Crystal Burungi, you know, in the fight against malaria, the two of us as young people were featured on this tweet chat, the Twitter chat, alongside with some of these other highly placed professionals in the space, right? And we also spoke and made contributions as young people, speaking on behalf of the voices of a lot of young people across the continent, right? So it's a very huge platform that we need to keep advocating that it's not enough to tell us to carry placards and be going around the street. And we are going to do that. But while we are doing that, when you go to make the decisions, when you go to make the policies, can you have us there so that we can tell you how our generation feel about this issue, about this policy, about these changes? It has to be deliberate, okay? It has to be deliberate. 
right? So let's move to the next slide. We're coming towards the end of the session. This is the last point that will be given uh, for this session. I think I've, we've talked a lot and we've spent so much time already. What is the call to action? What are the call to actions that I'm giving? I know we have individuals here who are representing international organizations or local organizations. We have people who are members of one political party or the other. We have people who are members of one agency or the other. Welcome to the call. I have a call to action to you and the youth. <laughs> The youth, the young people in global health have sent me to you. And here I am trying to give you the message. Okay? So, for us to have an increased youth engagement in the global health initiative or in the global health platform or in the global health space, we need to do 10 key things that are highlighted. 10 key things. First, we need to recognize the value of young people. We need to stop seeing young people as a generation of people that don't know what they're saying mm -mm. because they are educated. They are passionate, they are creative, they are innovative, and they need to be listened to. The global health policies, the global health principles have given them a right to be listened to, right? The policy around human rights, right, has given them a right also to be listened to. So who are you to say no to them? Value them, value young people, right? Recognize them and value them, it's key. Ensure their representation in meetings. Ensure their representation in decision-making processes. Ensure their representation in policy uh, processes, policy development, right? Ensure their, their representation. Foster mentorship and skill development. Foster mentorship and capacity development. Be deliberate about empowering the young people you work with. Be deliberate about it. Be conscious about mentoring the young people you work with. I can't tell you the number of young people I mentor. I've mentored. I'm still mentoring as a young person. I don't mind. As I navigate one space or the other, I want to help 10 other young persons cross through that gap as well. That should be the mindset of every young person on this call today. That should be the mindset of every other person on the call. Thank you so much, Daniel. Yes, peer-to-peer -peer mentoring is very key, very, very critical, right? We need to start doing that. So while we're hoping that the generation before us are going to mentor us as young people coming up, we also expect that some of us who have made giant strides, who have made some bit of progress and have, you know, begin to have a footing in the global health space. They need to also start carrying other young people along. Those who are still at the level of advocate, carry them along. Those who are still making effort, who are enthusiasts, carry them along. We need to start allocating resources for youth-led initiatives. We don't need to be in that situation where we want to roll out a youth program and you say, no, you know, it is not as important as this. No, youth-led initiatives are as important as any other initiative in the global health space. We need to start allocating resources for youth-led initiatives. We need to start promoting youth-led research. We need to encourage young people to start carrying out research because their brains are fire. Their brains are, you need to read some of the research papers that young people are publishing these days. Go and read from the Lancet, go and read. My goodness, it's amazing how much local data can be generated if young people you know, invest in research at local level, right? We need to start enhancing technology and innovation. It is very important. We need to start establishing youth advisory board. It is very important. Let us have, if you can't have young people in the administration or in the administrative level of an organization, create a youth advisory board that you can always go back to, to get the perspective of young people and add to your policies and add to your programming. It's very important. We need to start promoting health education and advocacy. It is key. We need to encourage partnership and collaboration. We need to support youth health champions as much as possible. Once young people become passionate about stuff, let's empower them. Let's support them. Let's encourage them. Let's create opportunities for them to travel. Let's create opportunities for them to network with other colleagues in other countries. Let's do these things. It is very important. It is very, very important. It is very, very important, right? So um, I think this is where I'm going to be drawing the curtain. Please push on to the next slide. Thank you so much, you know, Johan, for having me this evening. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. It's a pleasure for me to be here, and I'm glad to have spent this much time. I have my social media handles displayed on the screen, my Twitter handle, my Instagram handle, my LinkedIn, my email address if you want to send me an email. It's going to be there for a couple of seconds. Feel free to connect with me. Send me requests. I accept and I follow back as much as I do as I can, right? So let's connect. 
If this session has been interesting for you, let me know in the chat box. Let me know because I can't see my screen. Let me know what you're learning. Let me know if this is making sense to you. If this has helped you, if this has changed or shifted your mindset, I would really love to know, right? I would really love to know. Thank you so much. And it's a pleasure to be here. Okay. I look forward to your questions. I think some are already in the chat, but then I will allow the moderator to lead that. Thank you so much. Over to you, Ruth. Okay. So thank you so much, Ambassador Kingsley. So, ladies and gentlemen, please, if you have any questions so far, can you type them in the comment section so we can ask Ambassador Kingsley? Our time is far spent now, so please let's be quick about it. So as we wait for it, I have one question here from Tai. He said, Ambassador Kingsley, as a youth, if you can tell us how we can pass all our challenges from the local to the global level. Fantastic. That's that's a very beautiful question. Um, in fact, I'm going to tell you right away, right? You know. Like I shared an instance, how we started advocating for youth inclusion in the fight against malaria. I, you know, the work we're doing at Block Malaria Africa Initiative was at local level, at community level. It was just myself and a team of over 500 young people that were able to mobilize to carry out this um, advocacy effort and then to carry out this, um, you know, work at community level. But then through the power of social media, we kept reporting how much effort we were making, you know, I remember when we started Block Malaya Africa, quite a lot of people had approached us to say, we're not sure this idea you're implementing is going to work. You people are too young to do this. Somebody once said, you people are too young to do this, right? <laughs> you people are too young to lead these kind of things. You know, um, where do you get your money from? Where do you get funding? You're not going to get funding. Nobody will listen to you. We had a lot of those things happen. Honestly, we heard. I heard I, as, a, as a team lead at the time, I had to be started with the responsibility of encouraging my team every single time, right? But guess what? We leveraged on social media like never before. Every work we were doing, every success we were recording, and we were sharing on our social media pages, right? And we never knew that people were watching. We never knew that. Like, we never knew people were watching, right? You know, one way, one day, someone made a recommendation, uh, recommended me to Malaria No More UK, Dr. Elvis Eze, right? <laughs> you know, he recommended me to Malaria No More UK. So Malaria No More UK started to hear about how young people, you know, should be, they decided to think like young people need to be included in this fight. How do we leverage the youth population in the fight against malaria and all that? And while they were thinking about that, somebody in the meeting mentioned that there is a young, uh, there's a young person in Nigeria who does a lot of work on malaria and they have seen a lot of their work on social media, on Facebook. Guess what? They went back and tracked the work that we're doing on social media to verify if this was true. And upon verification, they sent, they reached out to me and they said, hey, we see the work you're doing, we like it, is this, is that. We're shooting a video in Lagos, in Nigeria. We're coming all the way from London. I want to shoot a video in Lagos, Nigeria. Uh, it's going to be the first video to kick off the Zero Malaria Start With Me campaign. Would love to have you in Lagos. Do you mind? And I'm like, what am I doing with my life? I might, I, I would come here, <laughs> I'll come to Lagos, you know? And that was it. So sometimes you don't know who is watching. In the same vein, the, quite a number of the appointments I've received, you know, maybe like being appointed to the Amarit Advisory Council, for instance, or being appointed to the um, RBM Digital Youth Work Stream. I have no idea about how that appointment happened. I didn't apply for anything. I just saw an email in my inbox. Dear Odinaka, on behalf of His Excellency President Uhuru Kenyatta, I bring you greetings. This, that, this, that, this, that. Would love to have you in the first ever advisory council that Alma is setting up. It's about this, this, and that. Are you interested? Kindly reply this email if you are. And you're wondering, where do they know me from? Right? How do they hear about me? Social media. So as a young person, you have the capacity to utilize technology. I, I talked a lot about this, right? So utilize technology. Utilize your network. There are opportunities around you, but then you don't know about it because you don't belong to a network of young people who are advancing the same course as you, right? We have what we call the global malaria community where everything that happens about malaria is shared in that community. It's not like a WhatsApp group or something, but it's more like organizations who know themselves and collaborate with each other, right? So you need to find people, young people who are moving in the direction that you're moving, 
keep track with them on social media, follow them up, and then share your content and seek opinions from other people who have gone ahead of you, right? Don't undermine social media. I think that answers that question. Thank you so much. Yeah, thank you so much, Ambassador Kingsley. So let's remind ourselves to share our lessons learned during today's presentation on our social media handles and try as much as possible to tag Johan. You can hashtag Johan Africa, tag Johan, our media handles. And our second question here is, is there a difference between global public health and the normal public health? Specifically, let's say a master's degree. Is there a difference between the two? Ambassador Kinsley. Okay, th thank you so much for that question. So. Um, I currently don't have a postgraduate degree. In fact, I'm a fresh graduate. For those of you in, who are in Nigeria, I am currently serving my country and I'll be wrapping up in the coming months, right? So, um, however, there's a difference between, um, it's not even much of a difference, but there's a difference between public health and global public health. Now, this is the point where I become so excited that Daniel is still on the call. So, Daniel is taking a PhD and then I would like to invite Daniel. Please, Daniel, if you're on the call, <laughs> please come up and help to answer this question. Is there a difference between public health and global public health? So I want to, the person is asking this question from the perspective of uh, a postgraduate degree, for instance, maybe a master's, right? Is there a difference between a global, uh, global public health master's or a public health master's, right? If you're still on the call, please help to answer. Thank you so much. Thank of course, you. yeah, happy, happy to jump in. Um, very good question, very challenging question. I myself was debating between an MPH or a master's in global health. At the time, it was a new program, this global health concept. The way I understand the difference is that public health is very boundaries based, like in the sense of your national context. So you learn maybe more at the local level and how you actually engage and deal with um, your current systems that you work in. So for example, if I did an MPH in the United States, a lot of it would be focused on the way the systems are in the United States. In the Masters of Global Health, it's really starting to understand that cross um, international learning, knowledge exchange, how these diseases transcend boundaries. So for example, communicable diseases we saw with COVID, how people respond and engage with something like that, like at the pandemic level is more of like a global health competency. And in terms of picking the Masters, I think also this is a general kind of difference between the two, but it also depends on the university. So you should very much look at specifically what kind of competencies they're wanting you to build. Um, so for example, my mine was at the Global Health Program in Copenhagen, and I could answer any specific questions about that. And there you can even do a focus on um, dealing with disaster management, or you could focus on what I did, which was health system design, for example. Uh, so it's that's built in considering the transnational aspect, I think, in global health. Yeah. Hopefully that helps. Thank you so much, Danielle. Thank you. Thank you so much. That was helpful. Yeah. So. Um, okay. okay. Thank you so much, Ambassador da Kinsley, Dr. Daniel. Thank you so much. I would like to give a few shout out to people here. Adina Kezainab, I see you. Thank you for being active. Bartholomew Tanko. Can you please, you guys, give us a few, in few lines, what you guys have learned so far? Bartholomew Tanko, you can talk. Adini Kizainab, you can talk. Herbert, you can talk. Ifunanya, you can talk. Maureen, you can talk. We are, we, we are far spent with time, so please. If you would like to talk, please unmute yourself and share with us in a few sentences what you have learned so far from our wonderful speakers. Please, you can unmute yourself and talk. Hello, hello. good evening. My name is Guys. Um, so far, what I've heard is that the young person have voices, they have great ideas, you know, and, and the world is awaiting them. You know, if we can just work on ourselves, you can just speak out, you can just start from the little way we can and from our 
the little place we, we, we have, you know, we definitely with time, we'll be able to amplify our voices and also to make good use of social media. Social media has a great power, social media has great efforts, so it has effect, you know, on, 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 on global health in terms of also collaboration too with other persons in, 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 the, in the sphere of maybe possibly our particular interest in public health. Thank you so much. Thank Hello. you, Joshua. Hello. Hello. Okay, yeah, Maureen Valley from Malawi. Thank you so much uh, to our wonderful presenters. I, I've, I'm really inspired, honestly. Um, I've learned like just in one line, I have to take care of this world for the sake of those coming after me. Thank you so much. Looking forward to tomorrow's session. Hello. Um, okay. okay. Hello, I'm Ifnaya from Nigeria, University of Nigeria. So um, Hello. I really learned a lot from this session. One of the things I learned is the importance of collaboration, like, you know, collaborating with people also the same space as you are and also making good use of, of your social media handles by putting yourself out there because you do not know who is actually looking at what you're doing and the work that you're doing. And maybe someday you could probably get a recommendation that might take you to the zenith that you're actually looking out for. Thank you. Good evening. Hello. 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 So we can hear you. Hello. Hello. Good evening. You can, can you hear me? You can. Can hear you. Talk, yeah. Sir. Thank. Thank you very much for the program. Uh, I'm Akaka from Uganda, and I have enjoyed the program, and I think we have to collaborate. Because, for example, I've seen the issue of malaria with the ambassador, and you know Uganda is endemic. And as I talk now, there is, there, there is a lot of cases of malaria under five. So with this, I think it is good for us to collaborate and see how best we can handle because I'm a uh, graduate from Makere with a Bachelor of Environmental Science. So these are the areas of speciality. I empower community to improve their health. So thank you very much for the, our presenters, all, everybody who has been on. Thank you, I've enjoyed a lot. And we are only waiting for the presentation on our, our email. Thank you very much. Hello, good evening. Hello. Good evening. Yes. yes, this is um, Vukumi Badiola, a graduate of Ladu Kakintola University of Technology and um, a current um, intern um, from Oyo State Hospital Management Board. All right, I must confess that Johan Africa is doing so great, is doing a great job. And um, I've learned a lot this evening from the section of Dr. Daniela, Dr. Daniel. Um, teaching us about the uh, importance of the, the good aspect of failure, uh, how you can turn failure to success. That is a very wonderful session. And also the session of um, um, Ambassador Kingsley, trying to let us know the impact of youth in the society. I mean, in the fight against them, um, in the fight in, in global health. And then I want to, uh, chip in this contribution that um, I have learned that global, that youth um, generally uh, to get involved, involved in global health policy making and we are to um, push ourselves in the table where policies are being discussed concerning global health. And then if for any reason we have any opportunity to get in the table, we should try to speak out voice out and then um, make our impact known in the global health um, 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 contributions in the global health and um, policy making. So thank you so much, um, Ambassador Kingsley, for that wonderful session. Thank you. 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 Th
Thank you. Good evening, everyone. Good evening. Okay. Right, my name is Pablo Mitango. Go ahead. Right, my name is Bami from Kaduna State University, Nigeria. I'm so sorry, my network has been fluctuating um, pure now, but I want to actually acknowledge the effort of facilitators and thought person over here. And what I've actually learned from the presentation is that I use as so important in the root of every nation. And uh, if youth are being included in the activity that takes place uh, in the society or in their world, they tend to shape you through the influence or utilize the knowledge of technology and aspects like actually accumulated before now. And so where the use of social media, we could actually harness uh, the the we can actually harness the resources or should I say the the opportunity is great. So I've actually learned that wherever we are, we have to be committed as young persons. We have to give in our best to make the world a better society for each and every one of us. And so I've, I've actually learned that what um, we we should take uh, people as they are. And we shouldn't. We should show equity and amongst ourselves, and also to love us um, a more reliable and a conducive environment for each and every one of us. So in this, what um, there's no limit to what we can do as young persons. So whenever we find, wherever we find ourselves, we try to do or to shape the society and the world around us. So I'm actually grateful for this section. I anticipate and wait for more of this. So kudos to all our uh, resource person this evening. I salute you for your effort. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, everybody. Um, welcome to the end of um, today's session. I would like to extend our sincere gratitude to you. Okay, good evening, everyone. Uh, good evening. My name is... Me? My name is Benedict Nelson from the University of Nigeria, Inugu, Nigeria. I must say I'm deeply impressed with the resource persons that spoke to us, starting from Dr. Daniel. Uh, her presentation was explicit and straight to the point, and I really learned a lot, coupled with those quotations of some people that really motivated me. I, I can say that the time I spent here has not been in vain and all those that were not around me actually missed a lot. So at the end of her presentation, I was able to get motivated as a youth on ways I can seek opportunities and continue to push forward in, uh, when it comes to health as a whole. And then the second resource person is a youth like me, Ambassador Odinaka, also shed more light on who a youth is. I think that aspect actually got me well. But I've been wondering for some time who actually a youth is and at what age can someone be adequately qualified as a youth. And then he also um, mentioned on the ladder of youth voice. This place also got me wondering and it shows the, the little ways that someone can start off as a youth. And then before he knows it, with constant effort and determination, you see that person at the top. And then the roles that youths play in global health. I've never thought of these things before. When I see young ones like him pulling giant strides out there, I also feel motivated and I'm determined to also start letting my own voice to be heard. And as youths, when we collaborate together, we can actually improve the health of the status, not only in Nigeria, which is our home region, but also in Africa and in general. Thank you very much, and I really benefited from the program. Thank you so much. Um, I would like to um, thank everyone for attending the session. Thank you so much. To, I would like to 
to extend their um, uh, gratitude to the speakers, Dr. Daniel and Dr. Kim and uh, Ambassador Kinsley for the informative session. And thank you to thank you all everybody for your active participation. We sincerely apologize for exceeding the closing time. Um, but I'm grateful that everybody learned um, quite a lot from today's presentation. So um, the session will continue tomorrow. It's going to happen in the same, um, we're going to still use the same platform, Zoom, the same link, and it will start by um, 4.45 p.m. West African time. Uh, hopefully, it will not exceed, we will, we will try to be um, time conscious. Thank you once again, and um, good night. Have a good evening. Yeah, thank you so much, Johan. And um, Danielle, thank you so much as well for honoring. <laughs> Pleasure. Of course, I'm glad we finally got to be in the same platform. <laughs> yeah, I, I, was, I was looking forward to it. So I, I knew um, <laughs> it's going to be a lot of learning. So I, I'm glad, <laughs> you know, very powerful session you shared there. Thank you so much for, for, for doing that. It's, it was really helpful a lot. Yeah. My pleasure, and I, I couldn't capture all your great quotes, so I captured <laughs> I, I, I talk, I talk it fast. It's a problem. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but a lot of really good ones, like really good aha moments. Great job. I, I was just sending you a direct message about your class in October. Oh, okay. Ah, <laughs> uh, yes. Oh, yes. Yeah, I never sent you the answer yeah, yeah. of that. I'm sorry I didn't get you engaged. Queen's University is pretty bad with like coordinating ahead. So I didn't even get the okay. link until like the day before. Um, but I could send you the new slides okay. and happy to talk to you. Yeah, it, it's the last time I think they'll do it this year. It used to be specific to the medical students, but they're changing the structure of their program. So they said they're not gonna do this seminar anymore. Yeah. For the medical students, I don't know if it's just gonna be for public health next time, but yeah, it's uh, three years so far. <laughs> Okay, that, that's fine anyway. I'll keep tabs with you to follow up on that. Okay, perfect. Thank you so much for the presentation. It was actually a wonderful presentation and I gave a lot of things. So talking about my role as a youth in global health, most especially when we talk about the awareness, I gained insight into it. And also during Dr. Daniel explanation about during the question rather the question and answer sections so i actually gave a lot of things and it was a wonderful presentation indeed thank you sir thank you so 